Very good. Thanks so much uh, for having me, inviting me, inviting me, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, let's see. I want full screen here. Good. Um, so, oh, wait a minute. This is not the beginning. Um, okay. So yeah, like uh, in the introduction, uh, this is the title. Uh, essentially, I'm going to tell you what I think uh, is the best idea to eat or avoid uh, for optimal health and uh, and planetary health. Uh, the, the guiding principles uh, are, you know, two sides of, of one coin, really. Uh, so good diets tend to be environmentally sound, good, uh, nutritionally good diet. Uh, diets tend to be environmentally sound, but there are some exceptions and uh, they only highlight the, the basic physics. They don't really uh, negate it, but it's worth uh, remembering that. Uh, you can uh, be uh, a vegan that eats very poorly, both from a nutritional and uh, planetary or, or environmental standpoint, but it's not easy. Uh, most uh, most plant plants plant based diets are are very good for both body and planet. Um, and designing diets that minimize resource needs. If you are only interested in reducing your resource uh, uh, needs and completely forget about uh, about uh, nutritional. Um, quality, uh, you, you end up actually, uh, without really trying, with uh, epidemiologically sup superb uh, diets. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the obvious example is shown right here on the left is, I don't know, an American uh, typical uh, meal, if you can call it that. Uh, uh, on the right is something I just made myself a few lunches ago. Um, you know, what, what, what does it have? Purple onion, tomato, black beans, some kimchi, nothing much really. Uh, straightforward tomatoes. Good. Um, so um, that's what we're going to uh, try to do. We're going to... Uh, to try to compare uh, different diets in terms of both the environmental and the nutritional standpoint. Uh, we'll start with a little survey of, uh, of um, the key impacts. Uh, and the first one is emissions. Now, uh, there are many good reasons to try to modify your diet uh, to reduce your uh, resource need. Uh, emissions are important because it is the defining challenge of our time, but it is uh, not something that agriculture actually dominates over. There are other things like transportation, power uh, generation, and uh, industry, and, and the living, the, the, the built environment that are either equal to agriculture or um, or actually a little larger. Um, but let's start with that because it's our defining challenge. Okay, so he, here is a, a, a nice paper that uh, claims that food systems globally are responsible for about a third of all uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's a bit high. Uh, there will be those who take issue with that. Um, but it's not really it's supremely important, the exact, if it's 27 or 31 uh, percent. It's important, and that's, uh, that's enough, you know? OK, so. Um, uh, I wish, okay, I'll do this. Ah, nice. Um, good. So um, what is uh, the concern here? Well, well, the concern is you, you, you see on the upper right here um, a simplified version of the global 
radiative balance, okay? It's about 340 uh, watts per meter squared. Uh, it comes down from the from the sun. About 100 or so is, um, is reflected either from high clouds or medium clouds or, or uh, the surface. So uh, the point is that this amount, uh, this uh, reflected 100 watts per meter squared, that's uh, stuff that came all the way from the sun clear to uh, to Earth, uh, 150 million kilometers or so, only to be rejected at the last second and not contribute anything to uh, to planetary uh, thermal balance uh, because it's rejected right off the bat. Um, and then there are some some, there's some solar radiation that's absorbed by the atmosphere, most of it by ozone in the stratosphere, but not only, there's also water vapor and so on. Um, ultimately, you get off this 340 watts per meter squared, you get hitting the surface 160 watts per meter squared. And that's what warms the surface, okay? Now, uh, the planet, returns uh, the favor uh, by uh, radiating infrared radiation to space. The issue with anthropogenic climate change is take a look at the, how small it is. You see, if you subtract 100 from 340, you get 240, right? But here it says only 239 watts per meter squared go up. Ah. So there's one watt per meter squared is actually one and a half or so, but rounding it's about one watt per meter squared extra more heat uh, warming the surface than is able to escape uh, to space. That's our problem. This one watt out of 340 uh, coming in. So it gives you a sense that it's a really small imbalance, but it adds up, of course, to the... Um, to the observed warming. So, um, so, so if we look at uh, the impact of agriculture on, uh, on all of that, um, we, and this is, a, you know, from a very, very nice uh, paper in science a few years ago, not, not ours, just a very nice uh, paper. Um, and you see here, uh, right here, um, the, the global emissions, and they're broken roughly as 26%, according to them. Uh, the, the other estimate we saw was about a third, okay? So this, this is what I meant when I said others uh, think it's a little smaller. So poor Nemetic uh, pinned it at 26, and I find that a, a bit more persuasive. Um, but it's somewhere in that vicinity, okay? And, and so it means that about three quarters are not related to food, okay? So that's what I meant earlier when I said uh, it, it's very important, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with food production are very important because of the great import of anthropogenic climate change, but it is not to say that agriculture dominates that. It, it, it is in fact about a quarter to at most a third of the scope of the problem globally, okay? Uh, now, if you look at what in the emissions in the one quarter of all emissions that are related to food, how, is it partitioned among the different ways we feed ourselves? So you see that a large portion, maybe a quarter of the quarter, is related to land use, which means simply you take a piece of land, let's say uh, outside my window in upstate New York, uh, if you left the, con the land alone and came back um, 50 years later, you'll have uh, a dense forest. So uh, if you don't allow the forest to grow, but instead you grow uh, cucumbers there, uh, that changes the carbon balance and that releases some uh, carbon to the atmosphere. And that is the contribution 
related to uh, uh, to land use, uh, this bottom portion. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that you can see my uh, my uh, pointer. Uh, let me know if you cannot, uh, and then I'll refrain from using it. Uh, so um, the other uh, roughly quarter, a little more, is um, related to crop production. Okay, um, and crops. Did this uh, dark, uh, whatever, blue, yellow, uh, uh, green, something like that? This uh, portion contributes about sixty percent of all human edible protein, yet it only claims about a quarter of the quarter of all emissions. So that right there tells you, um, oh, eating uh, 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 directly uh, plant crops is a very uh, effective way to feed ourselves. Now, here is livestock. It's nice that they say livestock and fisheries. It's very kind to the livestock industry, but you can forget about fisheries. It's just a small little icing on the cake. Uh, it's really livestock, okay? And that's 30% um, ish of all uh, food uh, emissions, but it contributes very little. Uh, for example, in terms of calories, um, meat uh, writ large it, it contributes something uh, like uh, 300, 350 kilocalories per person per day out of something like 2,800. So it contributes very little and it claims a great deal of uh, uh, the total emissions. And finally, up top, you have the supply chain and it's rather small. It's maybe one fifth or even less. And that goes to show you that you don't really need to worry about, um, uh, you know, consuming local food or something like that. that. That's really, if you want it, you can do it. There's it, it nothing wrong with it, but it's uh, otherwise you're just uh, spinning your wheels, achieving very little for a great deal of effort. So you might as well just... Uh, shop normally and not worry about where the food is coming from. Uh, the exception to that would be highly perishable things like, uh, uh, you know, let's say you buy uh, blueberries and they were flown, uh, they can be flown even from Maine, but but let's say uh, they've been flown from New Zealand or, or, or Mexico, something like that. That's a non-starter. You, you really uh, are enhancing greatly your emissions uh, for very little benefit. So don't do that if you can help it. Uh, but mostly transportation is not really super important to the total emissions uh, feeding ourselves requires. Okay, so um, you, th th this is very important, okay? Uh, here I showed you some average statistics, okay? but you're confronted with that and you can you can just feel um okay so that's what it is what, what can i do about it i i need to eat um so it's terrible maybe if you look at it and you think it's terrible you might think it's terrible but there's nothing i can do it's not so terrible actually but uh it, you it's easy to feel like there's nothing you can do well actually you can do a lot okay so here's a calculation um, that uh, strives to quantify um, what happens if you replace either all the meat in the diet, this is for the American diet, or just the beef. This bar right here corresponds to all the meat in the diet, and this corresponds to all only beef, okay? And you have two bars, two, let's call them sub bars in each, okay? One is uh, shown here in green, uh, bright or, or, or muted uh, green. That is how much emissions the plant-based replacement results in. 
this blue and red, that's how much what you replace, the meat that you replace, how much it um, emits, okay? So let's uh, uh, flesh it out here, so to speak. Uh, let's focus on replacing only beef, like as shown here, with some plant alternatives. The beef uh, results in emitting something like 2.7. That's kilogram of CO2 equivalent per person every day on average. And if you replace that, here is a, a, a nice... Uh, Middle Eastern dish I made uh, not that long ago. Um, it's called sabacha, and um, here is, uh, like I said, the em emissions from producing that. And now, if you replace it with the plants, this or other of, of your choosing, this is how much you get. You see right here, if you replace the beef with plant-based alternatives, you drop your emissions to 15% of what they previously were, okay? And this is not um, careless or random or any of those things, replacement. This is an extremely methodical and careful replacement where not only do you conserve the protein, so, so you forgo this, and this supplies now a certain amount of protein, well, you require that the plant alternative replenishes or exceeds the amount of protein that you uh, chose to forgo. But not only that, you're also satisfying 44 inequality constraints such as no less of uh, vitamin A or K or no less uh, selenium or zinc uh, uh, um, uh, in your diet or no more simple sugars than the replaced beef contains. In other words, you replace steak with the upper right plant alternative, but you do that with great nutritional care such that not only would you maintain health, you will actually improve it greatly. So you, just by making that one choice, you can eliminate 85% of your emissions. That's not small. 85% uh, elimination, that's uh, huge. Okay. Now, what about nutrition? That's very important. So, um, well, this is this quantifies that. It, it, and each um, each nutrient, not all of all forty four are shown here, but some of the key ones are shown here. Let's take a look, for example, at beta carotene, um, which, which is I'll show you and I'll quantify it in a minute. But this is a, a known protective nutrient, okay? Here is what it says. You, you see here a red little guy right here? And here is the beef replacement. That red, uh, it, it, the, the degree to which it proceeds to the right, how far it goes to the right, that tells you how much beta carotene the, the beef that you're replacing used to give. This right here, with this uncertainty range, is how much you get from this a, a, a carefully designed an, an alternative that uh, conserves protein, but uh, is otherwise and is diverse. You know, in other words, we don't eat one or two plant items; we eat at least five. So it's diverse, it's palatable, and, and so on. Okay, so what does, uh, and what are the units here? For example, beta carotene, it says that you get 150% of the average amount of beta carotene the average American gets from their entire daily 
uh, uh, diet, you get 150% of that just from the small replacement. Does that make sense? You have the whole diet. Of that, the replaced beef is a very small contribution in terms of calories, in terms of protein, in terms of everything. It's very small. Okay? Just that replacing that tiny sliver of your diet uh, from uh, uh, beef to a plant-based alternative, you get instead of something like five uh, percent of uh, of the beta carotene uh, in your diet, you get something like one hundred and fifty. Okay, folate, uh, same idea. Uh, you know, vitamin K, vitamin A, soluble fiber, fiber. Uh, phytosterols, uh, total uh, fiber, uh, uh, you know, on and on and on. Each, almost each of the protective nutrients, you get far more by making this replacement. There's one exception, and that's B12. Yeah, of course. Um, there is no B12 in plants, more or less, period. So, uh, yeah, it's very simple to just, you know, I, I do it with nutritional yeast, but a person can just pop a pill if they are really concerned about B12 deficiency. It's a real concern if you're not careful and you only eat plants and you are not uh, paying attention to your uh, B12 re replacement, you can run into pro uh, trouble. But um it's very, very simple to ameliorate that or uh, uh, avoid that. Okay, so let's see what that does, okay, uh, to the human body. Uh, so here is uh, in the upper graph, the upper left graph, you see the hazard ratio for overall mortality as a function of circulating beta carotene in your blood. Okay, and what it says over here, you have the regime of people um, who eat almost no uh, vegetables and no fruit to speak of, and they are very deficient in beta carotene. Well, they're about 40 50 percent more likely to die than, uh, let's say, a person with 640 uh, micrograms of beta carotene per liter of, of blood, okay? So uh, it, think about it, from 0.7 to 1.4, you, you doubled your odds of dying. This is not a small effect. This is uh, like switching from a, a safe car to uh, a, a switching from somewhere around here to somewhere around here uh, is almost like switching from a safe car to uh, a, a motorcycle racing or, or something like that. Uh, a, a huge doubling of your uh, overall odds of dying. Um, how about cardiovascular disease mortality? Well, it looks kind of the same to me. Um, again, uh, at least uh, within the low end of the curve, the more beta carotene in your uh, cir circulating in your blood, the dramatically less likely you are to die. For example, here again is 1.4, and here again is 0.7, half uh, uh, the odds. The probability is half, okay? Uh, now, adding a whole bunch of it, in other words, uh, uh, you know, here is eating uh, a carrot a day, let's say. Uh, here is eating uh, a bag of carrots a day, and here is eating a box of carrots, or something like that. You get the picture. Uh, you don't need to become a rabbit. Uh, just have a, 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 a carrot every now and again, and you are in the um, desirable uh, part of the curve. Uh, conversely, uh, don't worry about eating any of those, you, you know, uh, orange and and uh, and uh, yellow vegetables, and you may well end up on the left hand side of the curve, 
uh, which means doubling the odds of dying either from cardiovascular disease or uh, from any cause. Okay. Um, uh, here's a, uh, another one, if, if you recall right here, here's another uh, nutrient, phytosterols, and this addresses the contribution of phytosterol uh, in uh, ingestion of phytosterols in the diet um, to circulating blood cholesterol. Okay, In this case, it's a so-called bad cholesterol, uh, uh, low-density lipoprotein. Okay, and... Um, and um, you see that there's considerable noise, but the fact uh, of the decline with increased phytosterol intake of, uh, of um, uh, in, in this case, it's uh, the, the log uh, of the change of uh, uh, the bad cholesterol in, in your blood as a response uh, to phytosterol intake. And uh, the message is quite clear. You want to lower your uh, LDL, uh, you can use statins or whatever, and, and those are very effective, but uh, you can help it along, or maybe you won't need it at all if you have ample amount of phytosterols. And again, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that this one simple change, take this small amount of protein you get from beef, replace, me, replace it with the same amount of protein from plant-based sources, and you get instead of zero phytosterol, because phyto means plants, and of course, by definition, it doesn't uh, occur in, uh, or they don't occur in meat, so there's no, uh, there, there's a zero here. But uh, if you replace uh, that uh, beef with, uh, with um, plant-based alternatives, you get 50% uh, of the total amount typically uh, in, in the American diet. And um, you can look here at another one, okay? If you recall earlier, I showed you that, um, both total fiber and soluble fiber shoot way up, in other words, go way to the right uh, upon replacing beef with plant-based alternative. What does that do? Well, here are, you take the whole population, you divide it into uh, uh, five uh, equal, roughly equal parts uh, in terms of uh, fiber consumption. Uh, this is the uh, the uh, the fifth of the population that consumes the least fiber. This is the fifth that consumes the most fiber. And here is the uh, uh, rate uh, incidence of all cause mortality in percent. Uh, and you see that whereas here it's something like I I don't know maybe 22, 23 percent. Uh, uh, here it is only about uh, nine. So you, you, again, you roughly have your uh, your uh, odds of uh, all cause death. And all else being equal, having your odds of dying is a pretty nice outcome. Okay, uh, a, another one that I, here again I want to show you this. Uh, it's hard to see because this thing kind of covers it. But take a look at this. Uh, these two uh, uh, nutrients that occur in, uh, let me make it small for a minute so you can see it. Here, here it is, okay? Oops. Um, there is none in, uh, in uh, beef or meat, and there is tremendous amount in the replacement. Okay, so let's see what that does to the human body. And that's shown right here. So let's look at this. Okay, uh, here they are. Uh, uh, in the previous result, they were lumped together. Here they are uh, discussed individually. Uh, nutrient one uh, in panel A, nutrient B in panel B. Um, and um, uh, okay, so I, I need to explain to you um, uh, what it is. Um, you, um, you take um, uh, 
uh, th this is something that measures the presence of uh, uh, of um, uh, oxidants, those molecules uh, like oxygen singlet or something like that, uh, or, or, or hydrogen peroxide and so on, that are uh, thought to cause um, uh, genetic damage. Um, and you uh, you ask uh, uh, across a membrane how rapidly uh, they disappear in the presence of variable amounts of this nutrient shown right here. Uh, so just to be clear, time zero, you use a laser to zap the membrane and that produces a lot of those oxidants, okay? And then you follow the, uh, the uh, cell side of the membrane, or not the cell, the mitochondria, side of the membrane uh, and you follow it over something like a hundred microseconds to see how rapidly that oxidant uh, decays. Basically, what you want is for it to disappear as fast as possible. You know, like for example, if you eat something nasty and that result, or, or you have chronic inflammation and that results in uh, the presence of oxidants, you want them. You you want your cellular me metabolism to get rid of it as fast as possible, thereby lowering the odds that it will cause genetic damage. Okay, so take a look at this. Uh, in the presence of high concentration of uh, this nutrient shown in green, to uh, blue and green right here, very fast within about eighteen microseconds. Uh, 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 it uh, completely disappears. Okay? Now, let's go to lower amount. For example, in orange, 6.9 micromolar of, uh, of this nutrient. And what do we see? Well, now it lingers much more. And instead of taking 18 uh, microseconds, it now takes something like 45. What about in the complete absence of that, like you will have if you didn't do the replacement and just stuck with the steak? Well, now it never goes down to really low levels. And uh, it stays pretty high for a very long time. The total damage is proportional to the area under the curve. In other words, uh, the intensity times duration of the exposure. Clearly, you really want to be in the green or blue regime, and you most certainly do not wish to be in the brown regime. That's the point. And that point carries over perfectly nicely to the other nutrient. The same behavior arises before. And you see, just to be sure that your measurements are robust and so on, they started measuring the, uh, the uh, activity of those oxidants before the uh, laser zapping, just to see that the, uh, the, the machinery, the, uh, the detection limits are such that you can really see zero. And lo and behold, you see nicely zero here and zero here. So the bottom line is, in terms of uh, the protection against antioxidants, the replacement of beef with plant alternatives is a really good idea. Okay, uh, what about, th this was for individual, uh, you know, this and this and this, uh, th they were all individual uh, nutrients. Like uh, here, it's uh, beta carotene. Here, it's uh, uh, phytosterols. Here, it's uh, um, uh, fiber, etc. And here, it's those other uh, uh, nutrients. But what about whole diets? We are not really um, lab rats responding to you know in a mechanistic one-to-one -one way. Uh, add this, reduce that. Uh, we are a little more complex than that. So let's look at epidemiology. And this is um, 
from uh, th this paper uh, that Aviva Musicus uh, uh, wrote in 22, I I'm a co-author here. And basically what she did is she, again, uh, she divided a, pop a very large population, something like uh, two and a half, almost three million person years of follow-up. Uh, she divided them according to um, to um, uh, the degree to which their diet, as they reported it to be, the degree to which this diet resembles or is different from this thing that we show here called AHI. Okay, AHI stands for um, Alternative uh, Healthy Eating Index. Okay, so again, you take all this two and a half, three million person year population, you divide it over here uh, is the fifth of the population that eats um, the least like ahi, and this is the uh, fifth that eats the most like ahi. And okay, so the, the most vulnerable or, or worst diet group is the reference, okay? And we compare... Uh, cardiovascular disease disease risk in other uh, quintiles or quartiles relative to the risk of the uh, uh, the group of the people who eat as differently from AI as possible. And you see uh, a nice uh, dose response kind of uh, behavior. The closer your diet is to ahi, and that means um, basically plant-based diet and no red meat to speak of, uh, the, the lower are your uh, cardiovascular disease uh, risks. And not by a little. If this is 100, then the risks uh, of these guys can be something like 75, but they can be as low as 65. So a very significant protection is afforded by eating as closely as possible to the alternative healthy eating index. But here's an interesting one. I told you earlier, you don't need to have a soul searching kind of um, self introspection. Oh, what do I do? Do I uh, uh, favor planetary health or do I favor my own health? No, um, because here, these people ate the way they wanted to eat. And here we just divided them according to how uh, close to or different from the ahi uh, eating pattern their diet happened to, to be. But here we show the emissions of these people's diet, and that is in kilogram uh, of CO2 per person per day. And you see that you uh, the worst or, or the people who eat the diet that is as different from AHI as possible, shown here, have emissions of something like uh, 3.578 uh, kilogram uh, CO2 equivalent per person per day. The people who eat uh, as close to AHI as possible have something like 2.6. So a very significant reduction. That's the beauty. And going beyond cardiovascular disease, here, here, here are the uh, are the um, uh, the odds of either uh, uh, over here you see incidents of various unfortunate events, and here is the mortality uh, rate, and uh, along here you see the risk ratio uh, for the enumerated. Uh, incidences or uh, outcomes or, or causes of death. So cancer, for example, okay, not really clear. Yes, this the average is lower than one, meaning uh, you get some protection, but the uncertainty range in, includes both signs, uh, both sides of one, so that's not so great. But here's coronary heart, oh, oh not so, it's not so great, it's not clear, okay? Coronary heart disease, the uncertainty range is nowhere near one. Uh, what is it? Well, it's between about 0.6 and 0.75, uh, 
Okay, so you reduce your odds of uh, suffering from a coronary heart disease incidence by somewhere uh, between uh, 25 and 40 percent. Stroke, a little less. Here it is, but still pretty good. Type 2 diabetes, very significant protection. What about total mortality? Very much reduced uh, in the group that eats uh, as close as possible to ahi. All cancer right here, excluding one, meaning emphatic protection. Cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, neurodegenerative disease, you know, uh, uh, MS or, or ALS or one of those. Um, things we really want to stay as far away from as we possibly can. Um, well, there is no vaccine as far as I know uh, yet for MS, but what this is showing you that is that eating as close to AHI as possible is as close to an effective vaccine as, as we currently have. Good. Um, here, uh, and this is uh, from a different paper by Pan et al. Uh, also a really, uh, it's a bit old, but it's a great, great paper. And, um, and um, oh, I wish I could hide this. Let's see. Can I hide? Yes. How about that? Nope. Um, well, all right. I guess I'll have to live with it. Okay. Um, anyways, oops, sorry. Uh, here we go. Okay, so on the horizontal axis, total red meat in intake, okay, in servings per day, from zero on the left to four on the right, and uh, the vertical axis, uh, hazard ratio uh, for, uh, for um, uh, total mortality, okay, uh, a, a, as a function of uh, total red meat intake. It's very clear, isn't it? Uh, that if you define the hazard of the group that eats no red meat as one, these people have a certain risk and you call that one. Well, the people who have uh, three and a half servings of red meat a day have something like 1.8, meaning they're 80 percent more. Uh, 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 their hazard is 80 percent higher. Okay, and uh, panel B is the same idea, just for a different cohort. Uh, the upper one is for the health professional follow-up study, uh, and you see here it's only men, and it's, uh, it's, it's something like 51, 52,000 men. Uh, the panel B is both uh, sexes and uh, many more people, about threefold uh, or so more. Um, same result. So panel B essentially corroborates what panel uh, it corroborates for both sexes what panel A said for uh, it showed for men only. Okay, um, is a similar result for from a different paper uh, for pancreatic cancer. Um, so on the horizontal axis is healthful plant-based diet index. Okay, so the further to the right you are, the, the, the better uh, your plant-based diet is. And the, the result is clear. The further to the right you are, the lower your hazard um, uh, for pancreatic cancer. Another uh, adversary we wish to stay on the positive side of. Um, yeah, in uh, the lower panel, it shows you essentially the inverse of that. Um, remember I said earlier, you can be vegan and cause significant damage to yourself. Do you see how if you choose really poorly your vegan food, in other words, you're in, in the somewhere around here, 
you really can raise your uh, hazard in this case for pancreatic cancer, but this generalizes to almost uh, any one of the diseases that we looked at earlier. So in other words, um, being vegan just by itself uh, is a good start, but it's far from enough. You really need to know what you're doing. Don't just, uh, don't try it at home. Well, do try it at home, but not without some consultation and with the right authorities, not with some, you know, fad diet uh, guru rag. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, right. Uh, okay. I want to do this for a second. Okay. So, uh, so, so here uh, from this Wang et al. paper, uh, the hazard ratio, ratio of total mortality, okay, um, as uh, a function of plant-based diet index. And there are different types, okay? UPDI is the unhealthful plant-based diet index. Hel HPDI, so UPDI is here, HPDI is here, that is the healthful plant-based diet index. And uh, never mind the others, now, it's just kind of an in but or, or joint uh, agglomeration, it's not that interesting. Uh, this is interesting, okay? So again, if you are a clueless vegan, willy-nilly embarking on a plant-based diet, but one that is very poorly designed, you can seriously undermine your health. And here you see that with the hazard ratio for total mortality. The more of this uh, poorly designed diet you eat, the higher your hazard. On the other hand, if you do the right thing, the more of that you eat, the better off you are. Now, don't think that the difference between here and here, which is the difference between undermining your health here or improving your health here. Don't think that this requires four PhDs in you know biochemistry, epidemiology, uh, you name it. No, <laughs> it's uh, you need to read. Um, I, I would say two books. Okay, read two books. Read David Katz and uh, Mark Bittman' uh, book on what to eat or whatever the hell they call it, and read Walter Willett's. Oldie but Goldie on, uh, you know, eat, drink, and be healthy, I think it's called. Um, even the Willet one, which is a bit outdated, still has effectively everything to the bleeding edge that you need to know in order to be emphatically here and avoiding with equal emphasis this. Okay? Now, they break it down further just it, it, to, to uh, in case you are not convinced. Uh, let me show you here uh, following uh, Wang et al. Okay, so these are uh, these are the outcomes, the hazard ratios uh, for total mortality for subjects free of chronic disease at the time of the beginning of the trial. This is for people with confirmed uh, CVD already. You see, there's not a real uh, great difference. It's just that, unfortunately, if you already know that you have a CVD, of course, your hazard is higher. That goes without saying. So that's why the funnel is a little tighter uh, for the right-hand panel as compared to the left one. And on the lower two panels, we address uh, uh, cancer over here and uh, diabetes over here. So subjects with cancer, again, same funnel, uh, equally wide. In other words, uh, the, the, you, you can have the benefits of a healthy plant-based diet, even if you already carry a cancer diagnosis, unfortunately. And the same, if less robustly, 
also applies to diabetes. Okay, this again is from our paper asking, okay, where are the, remember I showed you right here, okay, uh, over here. Oh, look at that. It, the closer to AHI, again, alternative healthy eating index, the closer to AHI your diet is, the lower your cardiovascular disease. And oh, by the way, it's also uh, uh, lower emissions. Okay, so now coming here, we're saying, nice. And what are the food items that contribute those emissions? Here for the quartile, the, uh, or quintile, excuse me, that adheres least to the ahi, and here, the uh, quintile that adheres best to ahi, okay? Good, so what do we see? All of those emissions, break, all the, of those emission breakdowns are dominated by the foundation. What's the foundation? Red and processed meat, which goes to show you, by the way, that even the fifth quintile as close to ahi as possible, still eats some red meat and some processed meat, red meat on average. In other words, these are not rabid fanatic vegans. No, these are just people who are a little more <laughs> mindful of their diet. Believe me, uh, no skin of th these people's backs, okay? Uh, adhering to to this diet, complete with indulging with uh, you know uh, with everything that you may think of as indulgence, okay? But just a little less of it. That's all. Okay, so this is this one dominating the scene. Next one is other foods. That's not that helpful because it's it, it's anything that isn't one of those that are enumerated here. Okay, but the third one that's specific. What's that? Hey, that, that is um, right here, eggs, okay? Um, no, excuse me, dairy, dairy, this is it, excuse me. So red and processed meat here, this is miscellaneous debris, so let's not worry about it. This, dairy, and the next one, poultry. Uh, in other words, it's the small amounts of animal-based products in the diet of the people who adhere as close as possible, not as close as possible, as close as pr is present in this cohort to ahi, uh, their main sources of emissions are not nuts, not legumes, not any of those things. It is animal-based products. You, By the time you are done with animal-based products, you are here. Look at this. Compare all of this to whatever is left, this bit. Clearly, this is vastly larger. Oh, and don't lose sight of the fact that while it is so much larger, its caloric contribution is really, really modest. Or if you don't like calories, choose protein. It's a little less modest, but still nothing by comparison to this. So it goes to show you basically that uh, plants require, the, the plant portion of the diet requires very little uh, emissions. For example, take a look, whole grains right here. It's nothing and a half, you know, it, it just is a very small amount. Good. Okay, so we beat that dead horse. Let's move on to um, to uh, another key impact, and that is land use. But I'm reminding you here from the nice poor anemic paper, okay, I'm reminding you where are the emissions coming from uh, that are related to feeding ourselves, okay? And we said that about a quarter comes from land use. 
So here is a nice uh, satellite picture image of Earth. And here, and you think, oh, what am I seeing here? Just the, the Northeast and here the Rockies and here I see the Central Valley, uh, you know, uh, geographical feature. Here I see the Amazon basin and so forth. But if you zoom in and certainly today's uh, satellites allow you a uh, perfect uh, resolution, well, what do you see? Basically, agriculture is what you see. Okay, so let's focus on that for a minute, okay? Here is the same calculation I showed you earlier, replacing the beef with a nice msabaha. And here you see how much land right here, okay? This is how much land giving yourself this state requires. That's about three and a half square meters allocated for a whole year per person, per day. Okay, replace that state with plant-based alternatives. What do you require? Something like one. Oh, one instead of three and a half. I like it. That's nice. 70% reduction. Previously with emissions, we had 85% reduction. Okay, we don't have that, but 70%, that's nice. Okay, that's the point of this graph. Now, why does this matter? Okay, let's, uh, it, it, there are two slides, uh, slides like that. So let's start with this one. Uh, reason number one, forgoing meat means we can feed more people on the cropland that we, that we occupy, okay? And remember about a third of all of the surface area of the lower 48s, for example, in the US, about a third is related to crop, is cropland, okay? Actively uh, cultivated cropland. Okay, so now this is what I'm doing. Here I see, um, uh, right here, okay? So you, you see 4.8 minus 1.35, where is that from? 4.8 minus 1.35, okay? So this is how much land each individual uh, conserves by switching from all meat to plant-based alternatives. Good. Times 365 days a year, times uh, uh, people only in developed nations. I can jack this up greatly by uh, multiplying that by 8.3 billion people. That's how many of us there are throughout the land, okay? But no, uh, let's say that, um, that we are only going to ask for a minor sacrifice, not for those who already have so little because they live in developing nations. No, let's ask it only of those, you know, the so-called haves. Who are they? Well, the citizens of the US or Germany or Australia, et cetera. There's about 1.2 billion of those people. Okay, so what do we get? We get about 150 million hectares of fine quality cropland spared every year. Again, how? By these people making this transition from this to this, okay? Good. So we now have a nice chunk of real estate, 150 million hectares, okay? It's something like um, 350 or so. Uh, million acres, good amount of real estate, okay? Now, suppose we planted rice on those. How many more people can we feed entirely? Meaning, very generously, 100 grams of protein a day, okay? How many people can that extra rice feed? Ah, 4.3 to 5.6 billion people. Depending who you ask, right now there are about between 0.8 and as high as 3 billion hungry people on the planet right now. Even the low end of this estimate tells you, oh, we can feed every one of them until they are nice and plump. Okay? 
Suppose you replace uh, this, uh, suppose you reallocate those uh, spared 150 million hectares to wheat production instead. Okay, you can have about two and a half to three and a half additional fully fed billion people. Soy tofu, about two. Peanuts, about one. Farmed fish, one to two. Poultry, even poultry, you know? You can still have 0 0.6, 0 0.7 uh, additional people eating very generously 100 grams of uh, protein a day. A very few people, save Tour de France racers, need anything remotely similar to that. And if, by the way, if you don't believe that, read Chris Gardner and, and David Katz. I found that more than persuasive. Okay. Um, and that's in a scientific paper. It's not in a. It's not in the book that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's uh, uh, look at this. Okay, so uh, now this is a paper that we now have. Uh, hopefully, will be accepted at PNS uh, soon. Okay, and we're addressing a, a long-standing thorn in the side of the community of people who wish to eat uh, in a sustainable and sensible manner, okay? And that is the panacea of grass-fed beef, okay? Some people will have you believe that grazing cattle is the cat's meow. It, it, solves our problems. It doesn't really. It, it, it is a poorly argued, semi-cogent uh, and false argument. So how do I know that? Because I calculated this. So let's look at the lower left, okay? And we're saying this. We Here, I, I devised a numerical model of a beef herd, okay, and it has the, the mothers and the fathers and the steers and the replacement heifers and they uh, go from one place to the other depending on their uh, phase of life and so forth, okay? And in the end, they emit, the production of that grass-fed beef emits what you see right here. On average, something like 320 kilogram CO2 per, per uh, kilogram protein, uh, but it can be as high as 420 or it can be as low as 280. Okay, now suppose you assume generously that running cattle on that land will result in increasing uptake of atmospheric CO2 and sequestering it below ground thereby eliminating its greenhouse contribution. Suppose you assume a sequestration rate of 200 kilogram carbon per hectare per year. Okay, that's what it is, 260 something like that. But let's look at what would happen if you allocated the same resources to non-beef alternatives. Now you have something like 20. So even if you go to the most generous, and this is this right here, I would describe it as unrealistically generous to grazing cattle. But suppose you, because I can afford it, I am as generous as can be. Take 350 additional kilogram of carbon sequestered every year under every hectare. Okay, where are you? Well, you're here, 280. Is 280 in your book higher or lower than 30? I think we know the answer. Now, I saw that there was a hint, so let's see if I can address that. Uh, yeah. 
the replays of oh, you know, uh, questions at the end if if okay 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 sorry good all right so um so you you see the point of this graph the point of this graph is nice try uh grazing evangelists because when you do the calculations correctly you see right there is this higher than this yes it is therefore this is uh superior to this from the standpoint of carbon dynamics now these are different types of grass-fed beef where is the industrial u.s beef that we have today here it is even the industrial beef is better than uh, the grass-fed beef under the most generous uh, sequestration assumptions. Is that really a panacea? No, it's not. No matter how many times you will repeat that, it won't become true simply because you repeat it over and over. Now, why is that so? Okay, that is analyzed here, okay? And uh, there are two things to see here. Those bars show you uh, emissions of uh, methane, only methane expressed as a CO2 equivalent. And uh, the horizontal axis basically said, this is the crappiest uh, feed, uh, that uh, a, a, a range based uh, grass fed beef uh, can eat. Okay. So, this is uh, think about, uh, you know, like a steep, parched uh, slope in uh, Nevada in July. Okay, where where it's really like Russian thistles and little else. Okay, that's what you're talking about here. This is actually fine, fine uh, grass, the the highest quality you can get. Okay, and so the cattle uh, or oh, herds of cattle that subsist on that crappiest of the crappy uh, feed or, or rations, they emit emit the most methane and their methane emissions gradually decline as the rations quality uh, become denser and uh, uh, the rations become denser and the quality gets uh, high, okay? So that's what it means going from the leftmost to the right. And this is the uh, dams, meaning the mothers, quote unquote, and this is Right here, the finishers, the young steers that are being fattened uh, uh, to, to be slaughtered, okay? And you see that, uh, well, yes, the methane emissions is slowly decline, okay? But they are still, even in the finest of grass, they're still higher, much higher, I should say, than the plant-based alternatives. In short, nice, but no cigar. To, to our friends from the, from the uh, grass-fed beef. Uh, okay, so uh, let me not worry about this for a minute. Um, I would like to wrap this up um, because uh, we want to have some time for, uh, for discussion. So yeah, I, I, I can, if we want, uh, uh, to, to refer to this, uh, we can address that uh, depending on the questions. But let's see where I can summarize this for you. Uh, so you do not have to, but you can, if you so choose, uh, help patients and people really, I mean, forget patients, hopefully you stay a person and not a patient. Uh, you can help people improve their health while greatly reducing their environment footprint okay the most important environmental costs of agriculture and diet are land occupation i told you some of the reasons it's important but by no means all carbon emissions water pollution by reactive nitrogen overload most foods that are good for our bodies are good for the earth exceptions mostly involve water for example 
uh, if you eat a lot of fresh spinach and it came from the Central Valley of California, your water footprint is quite dramatically higher than that of uh, a beef eater from Ohio. The single environmentally best thing you can do, if you're going to change one thing in your diet, it would be exclude beef. And all beef do not fall for the, for, uh, the grass-fed uh, beef loophole. There is no such a loophole. For most people, in most cases, this is also nearly the most effective step health-wise. Uh, avoid beef, and that is the one best thing you can do uh, for your diet. But that has caveats. This should not be taken as emphatic as the previous point, because it depends a lot what you will replace that meat with. You can actually replace that with vegan alternatives. They will actually undermine your health. You need to uh, try really hard, but you can. Okay, one cannot logically be con or, or profess to be concerned about hunger or food insecurity and eat beef. Those are completely antithetical. You can eat beef, but don't bother uh, uh, pontificating about your concern for food insecurity because you are contributing to food insecurity. And that is only in wealthy nations. In other places in Sub-Saharan Africa, none of this applies. Okay, I am all yours for Q and hopefully I will have A's. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, thank you for that presentation. So we're going to uh, begin the Q and A portion of this presentation for the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand in the uh, in Zoom. The instructions are in chat. Uh, we don't take questions directly from the chat. Um, so please raise your hand in Zoom. So actually, real quick, I just want to get this, uh, you know, uh, Mary's been waiting, so I'm going to go ahead and, and pick on her real quickly. Uh, Mary G, go ahead and, and state your or, or state where you're from and ask your question. So I totally agree with you. I become a vegan for the earth and for my health, but I've heard a lot about the philosophy of regenerative farming, which includes having cows that you move from area to area so that they poop on the land. And so there is animals, but it's not specifically for uh, the meat that the cows give, I don't think. I think it's more for aerating the soil and making it. So what is your philosophy on regenerative farming, which includes cows? Yes, uh, I don't have any philosophy. I'm no philosopher. I'm just a geophysicist, so I calculate. That's it. So I can tell you, um, I, I can tell you what calculations show. Okay, I actually wrote a paper. If you're interested, it's in PLOS Biology, P L O S Biology. Um, it, just myself, uh, and um, it was a year or two ago. I don't remember. Um, anyways. Um, I think that that is uh, correct, that uh, this is a distinct possibility. It will not supply us with the current beef, uh, uh, the same amount of beef we consume today. We, it, we, it will be a little over half, okay? Uh, so, but, but that difference is really very, very minor. It's like 50 grams uh, uh, per person per week. It's rather trivial. And um, I do find that extremely compelling. It will alleviate greatly many of the environmental problems currently associated with agriculture, but it requires the uh, commitment, ironclad commitment to reduction, not elimination, reduction of 
uh, beef consumption and also as a minor little additional hurdle it really requires a complete redesign of the u.s system instead of mammoth farms um uh, uh, you, you know 50,000 acres by one corporation in iowa let's say or in illinois um in order for this to be viable you need very small units with beef or dairy in the middle and it's exactly like you said the purpose of the cattle is not to produce beef or dairy these are just nice to have adults no it's for the manure their manure is high quality manure with uh, ratios of the relevant elements the relevant nutrients to each other so p to n to k for example or something like that those ratios are as close as possible to the ratios the plant uh and crops are plants the crop the, the plants uh favor and therefore it's high the highest quality manure it's possible but uh we will all have to think of this as uh, a Manhattan project like a challenge for the next 10 years until we replumb the entire uh, uh, country. And from that point on, we will have a lovely system that enjoys all the benefits that you enumerated and several others, um, and that produces a far superior diet to the one we have now. But all the agri agribusinesses will be out of the game, which, in my view, is a net benefit, but probably well, from their view, it is not. Well, the, you know, if we're saying not to eat meat, they have to be out of the game anyway. And these farmers are saying that the topsoil is so poor that we have to use something like regenerative farming to get the soil back to be able to grow plants. But thank you very much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. So so first of all, can you tell the you know tell all of us who aren't familiar with uh geophysics what a geophysicist is and what a geophys geophysicist does? Here is a geophysicist you're looking at. Okay. Um so so um so what is geophysics? You know, it's the totality of all the sciences uh, that are uh, brought to bear on uh, my interpretation, the, the, the relevant interpretation to the current setting. Uh, some geophysicists do altogether different things. But uh, for our purposes, picture the biology, the biogeochemistry, the uh the uh the um, geology uh, the agronomy all of those things as they are brought to bear on how we use the surface of the planet and the the depth of the soil immediately underneath it and the atmosphere immediately above it and all the bodies of water into which it is connected all the different physics that comes into this uh, uh, confluence, that's my department. Thank you. And um, to the point of the last questioner um, who was talking about using the animals specifically for the manure, to your knowledge, can we regenerate soil without the use of animal manure? Yes, we can, but it, yes, we can. Um, but it is uh, a lot slower and uh, more hesitant and tentative. There is a beautiful book uh, that I recommend. Uh, it's not thickly scientific. It's written by Dave Montgomery at the University of Washington. Um, I think it's called Dirt, actually. I'm not sure, but it's a great little book. Uh, very accessible, uh, not highbrow. Uh, but very solid and lovely. And he describes there, uh, they're buying, he and his wife, uh, buying this uh, crummy little place uh, in Seattle uh, with soil as spent as you can get and going all around Seattle, you know, it's Seattle, so it's every other storefront is, is a coffee place. And going around and collecting all those um, 
uh, spent grinds, uh, coffee grinds, and using that to achieve exactly what you're describing, not only that, but, but among other inputs, um, and achieving uh, what you're describing. Um, it's a really nice thought experiment. And in, in his case, he actually did it. It's not thought. He thought about it long and hard and then implemented it and enjoyed a success. It's not something I think he would not take issue with that to say that it is not widely scalable. But there are alternatives to that that are scalable, but it's slow. It's slow going and manure is really uh, uniquely beneficial for the task at hand. And how dire is the situation of the environment that we are that we are facing? Uh, depending uh, what it is, you know, I mean, if you are uh, uh, a fifth generation fisher person from uh, Louisiana, and now uh, every summer you have to, you can't fish because there's nothing in the ocean uh, for two and a half months uh, of every summer, uh, you would say that the situation is beyond dire, it, it, it is uh, uh, catastrophic. Um, if you are, for example, uh, a Midwestern soybean farmer, uh, you have already gone in uh, about three generations uh, through about half of all of your soil fertility in three generations. And the rate at which you go through additional remaining fertility is now much more rapid because you drive the land so much harder than your grandpa did, okay? So you basically are sitting on borrowed time. You know, you have 20, 25 more years and then that's it. You're not gonna eke out anything out of the soil unless you slow down, change your ways, and uh, think of the longer term. And it, it, for the soybean farmer, is that because of mo monoculture? Are there things that soybean, um, is the soybean no, farmer it, it, just producing for one supplier? Is there something he could do to, to save his soil? Oh yeah, there is plenty that a person can do. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, you can uh, leave it uh, uh, fallow uh, every now and again, uh, let's say every fourth year uh, or so. You can uh, you can use cover crops, you know, uh, nitrogen fixing cover crops. Uh, you grow them until they're maybe, you know, four to seven inches. Then you disc it in and, and that uh, enriches the soil. Uh, all the carbon that uh, the symbiotic bacteria fixed over the course of growing to, to, to the final uh, height, uh, that is nitrogen that is already in the soil. And that obviates the use of uh, synthetic uh, fertilizer. Um, you can, monoculture is part of it. It's not that easy to, to uh, forgo monoculture and, and do uh, interesting experiments because there is a yield penalty. And, and uh, as things stand, these people are not exactly making a killing. So, uh, so it's a challenging uh, problem. It's not an easy one. But from the standpoint of agronomy slash biogeochemistry, of course there are. There are many solutions and they are effective. They are just slow and they uh, will take a while until uh, you see a real difference. And meanwhile, you will make less money than uh, you did uh, before, although you will save a little bit of expenses because you will need to buy less agrochemicals. Still, the yield penalty uh, in most cases eclipses the savings associated with the use of less uh, agrochemicals. Okay, next question is coming from Stephen V. Please state where you're from and ask your question, Stephen. From Buffalo. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, not on a big scale, but on like just in your backyard, having your own little vegetable garden. What's your take on stuff like miracle Grow versus if you had access to horse manure? Does it make much of a difference in the productivity of the soil? Oh, in the productivity? Um, 
yes, in the long run, manure is is far superior for several reasons. One of which, first of all, you lose less because it's very slowly disintegrating. Additionally, it lingers for longer, uh, partly because you lose less, you know. Uh, now, the loss uh, can be aqueous, you know, dissolved in water, and that's bad news, but that's nothing compared to um, the gaseous loss, uh, you know, because nitrogen is very volatile. So it will, vo some of it will volatilize into the atmosphere and much of it in the form of nitrous oxide, um, which is a, a pretty powerful greenhouse gas. We really don't need any more uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so uh, if you ha have access to manure, I'd say it's far superior. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, one of the things that you that you had mentioned was uh, nitrogen nitrogen fixing cover crops, and one of the things that one of our speakers was mentioning was that one of the issues with organic is that they can't pull or, or that they don't have as much nitrogen because you can't put nitrogen um, chemicals in the soil. Could first of all, is, is that true? And could nitrogen fixing cover crops resolve that issue with regard to organic having more nitrogen in, in the crops? No, it's not true. It's not true. It, it, it's very short-sighted uh, to, to say that. I mean, you, you can certainly adhere very religiously to organic uh, standards, but have, uh, you know, uh, a short uh, four-week or, or three-week crop of uh, alfalfa clover in between and that will enrich the soil of uh of nitrogen in this case i mean the soil may be deficient in other nutrients i don't know but if you're interested specifically in nitrogen which is the nutrient most frequently uh applied and in the the largest volume you can certainly uh overcome that now some uh, some of the crops that we actually want are themselves uh, nitrogen fixing. The most obvious example would be peanuts. Uh, you know, some you can say, oh, I'm making much more money when I use the land for, let's say, cucumbers, fine, or, or tomatoes, okay? I understand, but you asked me a question about nitrogen, not about money. So, so the answer with regard to nitrogen is very clear, and yes, you can, be a perfectly on the right with the organic uh, uh, farming authorities and use uh, nitrogen fixing uh, cover crops, as well as not cover crops, but real crops, like I just mentioned. So to go back to the question of how dire the situation is, when you had answered it before, you had you had done it really with who, you know, who, it depends on who you're asking, right? If you're asking the, the, the fishermen in a certain area, you know, et cetera. How about for humanity at large? I would say that, it, it, you know, it's not catastrophic. We don't need to throw our hands in the air and say, forget it, we're folding. No, it's not that bad, but uh, um, we can do a, a whole lot better. I mentioned just one thing uh, earlier. I'll repeat it uh, once more, you know, um, the Midwest has been coated with this uh, thick blanket of, of, of high quality soil um, over, let's say, the last 12,000 years. It took us less than two centuries, really like three generations or, or four generations to go and decimate a whole half of that. So, okay, right now we still have the remaining half, so we may uh, feel all bushy tail about it. Apocalypse is not around the corner. But how great is it to feel that apocalypse is not upon you when you know it's you know, 25, 30 years down the road? To me, it doesn't seem reassuring in the least. Uh, you know, and, and then you address, uh, let's say, climate change. Um, the situation is really bad, is really, really bad. Uh, we have 
as a society, global society, have exhibited a zero capacity to uh, improve our ways. And it's, a, you know, our report card is has one item. Do emissions decrease or are they rising? If, it, if it's rising, you get an F. What is it? Rising. You know? So, so uh, you know, again, I, is the apocalypse uh, around the corner? No. No. I mean, uh, you know, New York State, right outside of my window, is much more like North Carolina nowadays than New York used to be. Okay, what about uh, the Lake Champlain area, uh, 250 miles north? Well, that is like New York City used to be, historically speaking. And um, to me, that does not sound like a great state uh, of affairs. But at the same time, I feel, and people like uh, who I listen to very carefully, like Mike Mann at Penn, uh, second me, if that's important. They, they, they say, yes, we we are in a bleak state, but we still have a bit of time. There's no time to waste. That's for damn sure. So, so just to clarify, when you say it's not around the corner, it's not happening tomorrow, but in 25 to 30 years, it's going to be, there's going to be some real meaningful changes. Is that is that my understanding? Well, there have been uh, real and meaningful uh, changes. And I encourage people, if they want to eyeball the change with their own eyes, go to uh, a, a nice website called Show Your Stripes. I, I can't remember if it's .com or .org or something like that. And it's a beautiful pictorial visual representation of historic uh, temperature records. Typically, it's around 150 years or so uh, of instrumental records of the whole globe, of continents, of individual places. I, I went earlier today to Israel, and it has one station, Jerusalem. And I'll tell you, Jerusalem, it, it, Jerusalem today and Jerusalem of the childhood of my grandparents might as well have been two different planets. So that's not 25 years from now. That happened already 25 years ago, you know? So the question is, what is the apocalypse? Are you saying any change from historical uh, uh, range? No, that would seem to me asking for too much because the historical change is just the happenstance. It's not like God said, let Jerusalem be within this envelope and now it's here and therefore it's a catastrophe. No, I mean, it always went up and down and, and you know, no need to panic. But it shows you pictorially that the change is upon us, that Jerusalem today is, is a good two to two and a half degrees centigrade or Kelvin warmer than it was uh, historically speaking. And it is true that if you go far enough back, you'll find other times that it was harder still. Yeah, but this was, you know, what was it? 200,000 years ago, or I, I don't know exactly, I'm making it up, but you, you see my point. That should give nobody any comfort, whatever. And to the idea that this is, you know, like we've had fluctuations of, of climate patterns in the past that were relatively drastic. Do we tend to see things like super volcanoes or major planetary events? And is this at all quantitatively different? You talk about anthropomorphic changes. Is this, you know, in the past, were they human beings that made those planetary climate changes? Or, you know, or is this uniquely us, this one? Yeah. Um so volcanoes, uh, nobody has ever uh, uh, blamed us for, for, for volcanic activity. That's, uh, you know, mantle convection. We, with all due respect, we genuinely have nothing to say uh, about mantle convection. But, um, but uh, putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, oh, we know very well, we mastered it to, to the T. Uh, uh, how to do that, and we're doing it with uh, over exuberance. Um, so, 
uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my answer. That that uh, uh, we have been adding tremendous amount of uh, uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, and the changes are uh, exactly what climate models are telling you. The changes are predicted to be based on uh, on uh, that one change. You know, if you run uh, a, 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 an ensemble of uh, climate models, uh, one which knows everything, all the volcanoes, all the solar cycles, all the natural forcing of climate, and you run it forward in time, and it kind of fluctuates, but it, it's basically flat. The observations do this. What does it take to uh, get the model to reproduce observations instead of opening a ever widening yawning gap between the observations and the model simulation. Only one thing, let the model be cognizant of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's all it takes and it goes exactly, uh, you know, the observations fall right inside the envelope of uncertainty of model prediction. That's all I need to know. Great, thank you. And I think Stephen V has another question. So uh, Stephen, do you have another question? I do, thank you. So um, I guess the question is, in terms of like reducing your carbon footprint, if you go 100% vegan, which I've kind of done, is that cutting your footprint in half on average or what's it, what's it doing? Uh, no, not your total. Uh, no. So let, let, let's be clear here. Um, the average uh, from your accent, I assume you live in, in North America. Is that Buffalo, correct? Buffalo, New York. Yeah. Buffalo, New York. OK, we are practically neighbors. OK, so so you are an American. So uh, if you were the average American, you are not because you're vegan. OK, but suppose uh, we're comparing you to the average American. That's about uh, 14 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. That's how much uh, the average American puts in the atmosphere. Of that, how much is associated with feeding you? Well, so for the average American, it can be something like four metric tons. So four out of 14. And for you, uh, it could very well be uh, around 2,200 kilograms, 2.2. Metric tons. So the difference that you made by the the uh, dietary shift that you just described is going from four metric tons uh, of CO two equivalent per year for your food to something a little over two. So you are you drop maybe forty five percent of your emissions associated with uh, food production uh, and consumption overall you dropped from 14 to something like 12. Okay, so the other question would be this. How many acres of trees would it take to offset my, say, 12, what, my 12, my, my current carbon footprint? Trees are tricky, you know. Um, is, so here's why. Um, suppose you could label the tree that you planted, wait a hundred years until it is one of those colossal oaks, and then make sure that this becomes some artisan, priceless piece of furniture that nobody will ever let it degas back into the atmosphere. That's genuine sequestration. Otherwise, if you're just talking about plain vanilla deciduous forest like we have here, uh, I mean, depending on the year, the temperature, the the uh, the precipitation, and so forth, you you're talking for a hectare something like between two three metric tons of carbon sequester per hectare a year, to as high as eight if the year is just so you know okay, but and on average something like four to five metric tons every year that baby takes down about four to five metric tons um, or, uh, per hectare. Okay, so now you are saying, uh, let's call it 15. Okay, so, uh, uh, so you need three hectares 
uh, to complete, uh, but to have those hectares with your name on them and share them with nobody else, then you completely offset your 15 uh, metric tons. And, and if we just said before, oh, I don't do 15, I do 12. Okay, so you don't need three hectares, you need 2.6. Okay, and, thank, thank you very much. And of course. Uh, how, how big is a hectare? Hectare is 2.47 acres, just, uh, uh, it's 10,000 square meters for uh, people like me who think in, in SI units. Okay, all right, perfect, thank but you. But it's 2.47 acres. Okay, so we need something like, like close to 10 acres per person worth of trees in order to yeah yeah save. all right i got that in my backyard so um mary g go ahead and ask your question yeah you were talking about how uh humans aren't responsible for volcanoes but we are i think responsible for some earthquakes with our fracking and who knows if we will graduate and do something to uh cause i don't know the heating to cause volcanoes, but anyway, I I do think no, we're I mean, on, I think for, we're causing uh, earthquakes with the fracking. No, that is a fact. There's no question about it. But earthquakes, you know, I mean, if your uh, house uh, crashes down on account of an earthquake uh, that was generated by uh, fracking, that's most unfortunate, and I feel your pain uh, very much. But it is not related. It's a it's a problem, but it is not related to the problem of global warming. Right, and um, so obviously we're in a grave situation. Whether it is tomorrow or in fifty years, you know, from you know geological period of time, that's a blink of an eye. Do you see the necessary urgency? Um, in, in any sort of meaningful response to um, to what's happening to, to the planet and then subsequently all the people who live on this planet? Absolutely not. I see uh, extremely uh, casual, lackadaisical uh, response, if that. Uh, you know, and that is true about uh, our response to climate change in general. Um, you know, I mean, there are some great success stories. For example, uh, wind and solar are the most rapidly increasing sectors of the power generation. Well, that sounds great, except that they are still rather modest compared to, you know, to the totality of power that we generate. So you can look at the, at the uh, half uh, cup half full or half empty. It's it's up to your uh, you know to your disposition. Um, but specifically in diet and agricultural policies, no, we are aggressively pursuing the worst policies that we possibly can. And now you may say, oh, those House Republicans, uh, they'll take us to the grave. No, but look, I, I mean, we had eight years of Obama. And who does he put at the helm of the USDA? Uh, the former governor of Illinois, or, or, or Iowa, excuse me, with Vilsack at the helm. Do you think that we are going to get meaningful positive change? And that's the best uh, administration we could possibly hope for in our lifetime. You know, so so, and what does Biden do once he gets in the White House? Reinstate Vilsack. No, they, we are aggressively pursuing making the uh, the agricultural policy worse. We're not doing anything uh, that I can see to to improve it. Now they will point to some. Uh, you know, 50 million to NIFA and, and, and uh, 12 million to another program, uh, long sided programs in the USDA. The USDA has very smart people, and some of them are allowed to think positively and are putting forth brilliant ideas. The problem is what impact the, uh, do these people have? as opposed to the dairy 
um, uh, lobby or, or the corn lobby or, or, or the ethanol lobby and on and on and on. All of those people who, who uh, want to take us down the worst agricultural policy paths possible. They have the upper hand. They have it in the Biden administration. They had it in the Obama administration. And I don't want to even think what will happen under uh, another Trump administration. Again, purely from the standpoint of agricultural policy. Are there any governments around the world that you think are a model or at least trying to get it right? Um, and and if so, what are the policies that they're putting into place that you think are right-minded? Well, in general, Western uh, and Northern Europe are doing uh, useful uh, things. Like, for example, I mean, we had a paper some years back, and it wasn't the point of it, but it was just kind of like uh, on the side of it, we saw, oh, we, we compared different types of, uh, of beef production. And uh, wouldn't you know it that the single best one with the lowest emission was in Sweden? That's a result of something. You know, people are doing their something that should be done and isn't done in, in the U.S. or in Australia or in Israel. Uh, why do you think that is with Sweden? Is that you, so you think that that's it's a policy decision that they made that brought out that or is it just the you know, the culture is doesn't eat a lot of beef? What what What's going on? No, it's it's mostly for historical reasons. Uh, in other words, the, the main thing is that most of their beef production is not for the sake of producing beef, but it is actually from the dairy herd. These are black and white cows, no brown cows, okay? And I, I showed earlier the, the huge amount, dominance of methane emission from the mothers themselves. Well, we need both beef mothers and dairy mothers to become pregnant, but for two different reasons. The dairy one is simply because you want them to produce milk, you need them uh, to be postpartum. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, the beef uh, mother, because that is what we fatten, the, the, the steers that uh, she uh, gives birth to. So if you combine the two purposes like they do in Sweden, uh, in other words, it's a dairy cow. Its primary purpose is to produce milk. For that, we need her to be pregnant. And most pregnancies, lo and behold, end with a calf. So we have now a calf. Okay, so we'll fatten the calf and sell it. That would be nice um, extra beef. That's not our purpose, but it's a nice little extra. That's why. And what is the impact? So you talked about meat specifically, right? So eating the cow. What about the the dairy industry? If you know, if we eat a whole food plant based diet, and now not only do you do you not have the brown cows for beef, but you don't have the black and white cows for dairy, what is the impact on reducing methane gas if we did something like that? Let me see if I get it. Are you saying if we eliminated both beef and dairy? Correct. What was that? Y yes, both beef and dairy. Oh, um, well, we would uh, uh, here. Let, let's look at it. Why? Why uh, pontificate idly when we can look at the numbers? Um, so um, I wanted the poor Nemechek paper. Uh, that is, for some people, that is the Bible. Um, one second, where is it? Um, it is here. Okay. So, um, livestock and fish farms, 30% of all food emissions. Uh, okay, it doesn't further uh, breaks it down, but I would uh, venture a guess that half of that is beef. Another 30% of that is dairy and other, uh, you know, pork, poultry and, uh, and uh, uh, eggs are the remainder. 
So about 80% of this 30% will be gone if we eliminated both dairy and beef. And is beef Does that make sense? Yeah, so it would have a, a, a significant impact on, yes. on this. And, um, you, you know, the, you said something, I think the, the change as far as our diet, if we took out beef, would be like an 85% reduction. Is beef so impactful compared to other animals because of how much beef we're eating in relation to those other animals? Or oh, is, no. is it inherent about cows and perhaps their methane, or what would it be? Uh, it's not necessarily only the methane. Uh, the that is extremely important. But again, I I, I can show you the numbers uh, right here. Take a look. For example, let's look at this ration. Okay, that's characteristic of uh, typical uh, American beef. Okay, this is the contribution from zero to here is the contribution of methane. From here to You're not here. Your, I don't think, or at least, I, at least I'm not seeing your shared screen. That, that ah, might just... yes, yes, yes. Um, I will, sorry, uh, now I am sharing. Okay, see it? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm looking at this bar simply because these rations are kind of typical of the American beef uh, industry, okay? So from zero to here, to something like 150 kilogram um, uh, CO2 equ equivalent per kilogram of beef protein, that's methane contributions. From here until the total, which is shown in blue, that those are the contributions of the combined contributions of CO2 and nitrous oxide together. So here is methane, and from here to here, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. Okay, so thank you. And, and we have like one minute left. So I just wanna ask you this one quick question. Yes. Uh, would reducing methane have a greater impact on climate change over reducing CO2 or attempt or doing, th or doing the things that produce CO2? Uh, my understanding from previous speakers is that uh, methane leaves our atmosphere a lot faster than CO2 does, and is also a lot more impactful than, C uh, than CO2. Yes, so, so uh, there's some truth to that. So here's the, here's the deal. Um, CO2 on human timescale is basically a forever gas. You know, I mean, 600,000 years from now, if we stopped emitting completely yesterday, okay, 600,000 years from now, we would still have about 10, 15% of the CO2 in the atmosphere warming the, uh, the plant, okay? Uh, with methane, it could hardly have been more different. It, you know, it oxidizes into trivial amounts of CO2 on a time scale of 12, uh, 12 you know, 15 years. So in a century, you have zero, okay? So, uh, if you are looking for reversibility, in other words, uh, you want, you're willing to make a change, but you want it to be reversible so that you don't get yourself in a pickle that you can never dig yourself out of, okay? Then um, methane offered that reversibility because you know, you stop emitting it at some point and it, it disappears in, in, in 50 years. Um, if on the other hand, you uh, care about warming in the next uh, 10, 15 years, then uh, you would much rather uh, emit CO2 and not methane because uh, over a time scale of a decade, methane is, you know, over a hundred times more powerful. Great, and we are out of time. I it was it was it was really just starting to heat up. So I, I wish we had some more time, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much for all the information that you that you shared with us today and, and the work that you do. If we could unmute the audience so they could share their appreciation. For, uh, that <clears throat> thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.